Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Fish Bites, the Miami Herald's Miami Marlins podcast. I'm Jordan McPherson, flying solo this week. And just to give you guys a quick note up front, it's going to be a quick episode today, uh, dealing with a bit of a head cold and trying not to drag this out if I don't need to. Uh, we're going to dive into Skip Schumacher's intro presser and what lies ahead for the Marlins this offseason a little bit later. But first, I want to start with the World Series, where the Houston Astros beat the Philadelphia Phillies in six games. And why am I deciding to start there? Uh, that's because when the Marlins formally announced Schumacher, introduced Schumacher on Thursday as their manager, chairman and principal owner Bruce Sherman said the franchise is, quote, going to continue measuring success by winning championships, end quote. If we're going off that measure, the Marlins are 0, and 5, 0 for 5 since Sherman's ownership group brought the team bought the team ahead of that 2018 season. Miami's made the playoffs just once, as we all know, and that shortened 2020 season where they made it to the NLDS before losing to the Braves. Uh, since then, it's been another, been a couple more losing seasons. They had the two losing seasons before that. And they're at the point where they're once again maneuvering through yet another offseason where decisions need to be made and time is really running out for them to be able to keep the fan base convinced that something's going to be done here. But what they can do before we get to the offseason is the Marlins can learn a few things about both teams that did make the World Series this year. Uh, if we start with the Astros, let's start with player development. And 14 of the Astros' 26 players who were on their World Series rosters were homegrown guys, either drafted by the Astros or signed by the Astros as international free agents and completely brought up to the big leagues from inside the Astros system. Ten of their other players were acquired via trade and two were signed as free agents. Does that sound familiar? Because that's sort of the formula the Marlins are trying to go with, but have yet to have that success. If the Marlins are able to use that system where they're able to build from within, build with their homegrown guys, and be able to identify those guys early in the development process, and also develop them, that's been the key part that's been missing these last couple of years, they can follow that path that the Astros have been, been playing with. And remember, the Astros went through this rebuild phase themselves about a decade and a half ago. They've gone through what the Marlins are going through right now. They are an example of what a successful rebuild looks like. The Marlins just need to figure out a way to execute that formula. And then as for the Phillies, they're just the shining example of you get into the playoffs, who knows what could happen. The Phillies were the number six seed in the National League, the last team to make it in the expanded playoffs. They ended up getting all the way to the World Series. And the Miami, in a perfect scenario, was supposed to be in the Philly spot this year. They thought in heading into the season that they were going to be able to compete for most likely a wild card spot. You look at what the Braves did, what the Mets did, and what they had coming into the season. They were clearly one and two in the NL East. But the Marlins thought if they could squeak into that number three spot in the NL East, that could and should have been enough for them to be able to get to the playoffs. Phillies showed that that number three spot in the East was enough. And if the Marlins were able to do what they needed to do, they could have been hovering and competing for one of those final playoff spots going down the home stretch. They were in, they were in contention going into the all-star break. And then as we know, everything sort of just fell apart afterward. So player development, getting in, and then magic can work from there. And now to transition from that to, how they hope to get there this upcoming season. Let's go back a little bit to what happened on Thursday when the Marlins finally were able to formally introduce Skip Schumacher as their next manager. They announced the hire about a couple weeks ago. Thursday was the first day they were able to do everything because of just how things work with the World Series. MLB really tries to have teams do things on certain dates not to take away from the series itself. And you can see with Skip, you can tell that the passion's there, the excitement's there. He, Between him and Kim Ang, the phrases win and winning and building a culture and finding ways to win, they were used about as often as I say the phrases definitely or no doubt when I'm transitioning topics on this podcast. But as we know, excitement and passion and enthusiasm are only going to go so far. If he doesn't have the resources that he needs in order to succeed – we know how that's we know how that story goes. Miami obviously needs to bolster his roster. The offense and the bullpen are the biggest biggest targets going into the offseason. Again, I feel like we talked about this last year. Uh, and also 
some of that improvement is going to have to be internal. Jorge Soler and Avicel Garcia are going to have to bounce back from really bad years. Jazz Chisholm Jr. is going to have to stay healthy. The rotation is going to have to stay where it, stay where it is in terms of its quality of success. And also see some improvements from some guys, Trevor Rogers as an example. But also reinforcements from the outside and reconfiguration from the roster needs to be in play too. Bruce Sherman again on Thursday, he said the Marlins haven't had the success they wanted. That's apparent outside of the one playoff run. Uh, and he also added that, that quote, the commitment to the organization is very deep. But with that said, Sherman still hasn't committed to what number he'd be willing to grow the payroll heading into next season. He did point to the Marlins, the four deals the Marlins made last season, where they extended Miguel Rojas, the two-year $10 million deal, gave Sandy Alcantara the five-year $56 million deal with the $20 million club option for a sixth year, as well as signing Garcia and Soler. Obviously, Garcia and Soler's first year did not work out as planned in terms of their production, but they're, they're, the Marlins are showing that as saying they are willing to make moves if the moves are right. Uh, whether or not they're willing to continue to do that or make minor adjustments, that's obviously what will be interesting to watch as things unfold, specifically over these next couple months. He also pointed to what the Marlins did with their front office so far, adding Astros executive Ozzo Campo as an assistant general manager. So the Marlins now have three AGMs in their front office. And also the commitment they made in the Dominican Republic with their new academy development complex that they unveiled last month, $15 million project, 16 months complete. And the Marlins are optimistic that that's going to help them as they try to continue their improvements on the international free agency front. And as for Schumacher himself, his main priorities right now are keeping in touch with the Marlins players and getting in contact with with as many of the guys as he can, and also rounding out his coaching staff. He only has two members from Don Mattingly's staff from last season that he retained. They are both guys who needed to be retained, pitching coach Mel Stoudemire Jr. and bullpen coach Wellington Cepeda. This, it's, this, those two be, staying Mel specifically was to keep the franchise's the success from the pitching staff as well intact as possible, which obviously we've seen what Mel has done over these last four years with his pitching staff. Obviously, Sandy being the specific example as he go, contends for a Cy Young award, uh, the growth from Jesus Lazardo from when he got acquired in at the, at the trade deadline 2021 to what he was able to do last season, Braxton Garrett's improvement, Pablo Lopez's improvement, the list goes on and on. To be able to have those guys there and to have the pitching side handled is already a giant first step for Skip Schumacher. And as for the rest of his staff, uh, as of Thursday, he said he was still in the middle of interviewing candidates for spots, but know that his staff will consist of, quote, guys I've already known in some way. Either I played with, coached with, or I've known from being on the other side. I wouldn't expect this search to last much longer. I would think by next week we would have most, if not all, of the names finalized, and then see where things go from there. And then for the offseason as a whole, uh, there are a few key dates to know that we'll, I'll rattle off through here to wrap up the episode. Uh, first off, by Thursday, uh, decisions need, need to be made for the two Marlins players that have options in their contracts for next season. Those two are Jorge Soler and Joey Wendell. Solaire is a player option for $15 million. Spoiler alert, he's almost likely 99.999% going to take that player option. And then Joey Wendell is a $6.3 million mutual option with a $75,000 bio. Uh, Joey Wendell, he was limited to 101 games last year. Hamstring really got to him. The thing to know about Wendell is he still, regardless of the option, if the option is declined on either end, he's still under team control for one more year because he has one more year of arbitration eligibility. And his arbitration number is hovering in about the five point, uh, it's at the 5.4 mark, according to MLB trade rumors is projections, which are normally either spot on or very, very close. So I would not be surprised if the Marlins opt not to pick up his side, their side of the option and decide to settle Wendell's contract through arbitration just since it could probably save them about a million bucks. Uh, and also Thursday is the first day of free agency. As we know with baseball, free agency is usually on the slower front. We usually don't see a lot of things picking up until winter meetings, which is the first week of December. Get to that in a minute. 
uh, November 15th, the deadline to add Rule 5 eligible players to the 40-man roster. Four of the Marlins' 30, top 30 prospects, according to the MLB Pipeline, are Rule 5 eligible this winter. Uh, thir- uh, first baseman Troy Johnson, who's up, who finished the year with Triple A Jacksonville. Outfielder Griffin Conine, who finished with Double A Pensacola. High A Beloit right handed pitcher MD Johnson. And Triple A left handed reliever Josh Simpson. And a reminder about Rule 5 if a player is selected in the Rule 5 draft, that player has to stay on the team's active big league roster for the entire year outside of IL stints. So of these guys, I would think Troy Johnson is probably the only one that makes the makes sense to be. He's Troy Johnson is probably the closest thing to a must protect out of this group. Griffin Conine, we've seen the power potential with him. He's been he's held his own in Double A, but I still don't think that he's at that point yet where teams would be willing to take him and be willing to keep him on their roster for a full season. Uh, MD Johnson still in still in the bottom half of the bottom part of the minors. Josh Simpson could be another candidate. Again, he's a left a lefty reliever. Those are always highly valued, and especially if the Marlins are going to be retooling their bullpen, he could be a candidate from within for them to try to test the waters. And at the very least, he'd probably be a spring training invite regardless. So they might just end up knocking that out with him too if they have the space for it. November sixteenth, one day after that, uh, Cy Young Award winners are announced, which means that we are almost certainly going to be seeing Sandy Alcantara become the first Miami Marlins pitcher to win the Cy Young Award. He was announced as one of the three NL finalists on Monday, along with the Atlanta Braves' Max Freed and the Los Angeles Dodgers' Julio Arias. And we've talked on this show many, many times. I've written many, many times the merits for Sandy and basically how it feels like it's him in the field. And I would be shocked if he's not only the winner, but I would think he's going to be a runaway winner for the Cy Young, just based off of, again, the six complete games, how much, how far ahead he led the league in innings pitch while still having one of the top ERAs. And just, again, he was just downright dominant all year. So it will be fun to see that. And we will touch more on that as the award gets closer. November 18th. Uh, MLB's non-tender day deadline. This is the day where teams have to o- offer contracts to pre-arb and arbitration eligible players, and players who again players who don't receive contracts, which are the arbitration eligible guys who are either fringe players or whose expected salaries are deemed higher than their expected contributions, won't be tender contracts and can become free agents. The Marlins have a dozen guys who are eligible for arbitration this year. Uh, going to rattle off their names and their projected salaries based off of the projections from MLB trade rumors. Uh, Joey Wendell, if his option isn't picked up, he's at five point four million. First baseman designated here, Garrett Cooper, four point one million. Right-handed reliever Dylan Floro, four point two. Third baseman outfielder Brian Anderson, five point two. Catcher Jacob Stallings, three point three. Right-handed pitcher Pablo Lopez, five point six. Left-handed reliever Tanner Scott, two point seven. Right-handed pitcher Eliezer Hernandez, 1.8. Utility man John Birdie, 2.4. Uh, right-handed reliever Cole Solcer, 1 million. Left-handed, reliev- left-handed starting pitcher Jesus Lazaro, 2 million. Right-hand- and right-handed pitcher Jeff Brigham, 800,000. Of these guys, it'll be interesting. I mean, Ryan Anderson could be a non-tender option. Eliezer Hernandez could be a non-tender option. Everybody else, I think, is locked to at least get the contract and then figure out the numbers with the, what the arbitration numbers are going to be, especially since, I mean, I'll look at like a guy like Dylan Flora, for example, he essentially finished the year's closer the last two years. Even if he isn't the closer for the Marlins next season, having a high leverage reliever for his price tag that the Marlins know and the Marlins trust, that makes sense, Keith. Same with, again, Cole Solcer for a million we saw how we saw how he was good at the start of the year before he got hurt. One million dollars isn't much to isn't much to have to worry about on that front. Tanner Scott at two seven, yes, it seems a little high, especially for what we saw from him. But again, if he's a high leverage guy, seventh eighth inning guy, two point seven is a lot cheaper than what they're going to get from for some of the quality arms that are going to be in the free agent market and or what they might have to give up in terms of trying to trade for a high leverage reliever that they, that may or may not pan out. Uh, a couple other 
dates to knock out December 4th through 7th, MLB's winter meetings out in sunny San Diego. Uh, that's where the hot stove really starts to get hot, and we'll start seeing, hopefully, some dominoes start falling, whether it's directly with the Marlins or indirectly, to start seeing where things lie. And a couple other things that will be happening at the winter meetings. December 6th is when the MLB's first draft lottery will be will take place. Everybody who didn't make the playoffs is has a chance to get the number one overall pick. If I remember correctly, the lottery goes through the top six picks. The Marlins have a 2.7% chance to get the number one pick. So, yes, I'm saying there is a chance. And then the Rule 5 draft takes place on December 7th, the last day, as it always does. Looking forward to the winter meeting, especially since the last two years, they haven't happened. 2020 was because of COVID. 2021 was because of the lockout. So to be able to get back to the winter meetings where literally everybody who's involved in baseball and some in whatever capacity, front office executives, agents, uh, occasionally the players who are going to be part of the marquee deals if they get made at the winter meetings, everybody's all in one spot. So we get to actually start seeing everything and start getting start getting things rolling and making the offseason feel like the offseason. Uh, January 13th, deadline to for teams and arbitration eligible players to submit salary figures for the season if deals hadn't already been agreed upon. A lot of times deals do get made beforehand to just to settle. And usually it's at a middle point between what the team thinks they the player deserves and what the player thinks the player deserves. Uh, if, if contract salaries are decided by then, uh, the arbitration hearings normally take, will be taking place between January 30th and February 17th. And then mid-February, spring training begins. Beginning of March, we have the World Baseball Classic. And the end of, the Mar- and the end of March, season begins. We'll be talking a lot about all of this as the offseason progresses. Uh, again, we'll have stuff most likely next week. And then we'll probably be either probably about every other week from there on as news warrants so with that that's going to conclude this week's episode of fish bites thanks so much for tuning in everyone we'll be back again